In this lesson, we are going to study zeros and poles. So let us first recall that if we have an isolated singularity of a complex function, we can write it as an infinite series, but this time around, we have negative powers of z minus z sub zero. And therefore, we can write it in terms of this way. We will, um, we will divide it into two parts, the ones with the uh, negative powers and ones, the ones with the non-negative powers. And this is the Laurent series representation of F valid for this domain here. And for this lesson, we're interested with the terms which involve the negative powers of Z minus Z sub zero or the principal part of the series. Okay. We are going to classify the isolated singularities of a function depending on the number of terms in our principal part. So if the principal part is zero, we say that z sub zero is a removable singularity. So this is almost the same as in our definition of removable discontinuity. We will see that later. Why do we call it removable? Well, of course, we can remove that singularity. This one is saying that the principal part has just, so our f of z when we expand it, we just have non-negative powers of z minus z sub zero, okay? But if the principal part contains a finite number of non-zero terms, we say that z sub zero is a pole of our function. So in this case, our function will now have negative powers. Okay, and supposing that a to the negative n, a sub negative n, is the last non-zero coefficient um, in the representation, then we say that z sub zero is a pole of order n. If you have a pole of order one, we say that the function is a simple pole. And if the principal part has infinitely many non-zero terms, we say that z sub zero is an essential singularity. So for our principal part, we have so this one is really from 1 to infinity. Okay, so here is just a summary of the definitions that we had. For a removable singularity, as I have mentioned earlier, the Lora series will only contain non-negative powers of z minus z sub zero. For a pole of order n, so instead of writing it as z minus z sub zero raised to the negative n, so take note that we just have z minus z sub zero in our denominator, and then here these are the non-negative powers of z minus z sub zero. If we have a simple pole, then we just have this one a sub negative one, that is just our coefficient of z minus z sub zero, and the rest will have non-negative powers or the principal part of our, uh, I mean the analytic part of our series. And lastly, for the essential singularity, so this one will continue the non-negative um, non powers. Now let us discuss the singularity of sine z. So here I have already mentioned that this one is a removable singularity. Well, first, why is it a singularity? Well, because f is not analytic at z equals z at z equals zero, right? Because f of zero does not exist. So therefore, it is um not continuous and therefore not differentiable and therefore not analytic but of course for the rest for the for everything which is not equal to zero this function is analytic everywhere okay so um how do we expand this sine z over z sine z the 
the raw series representation of this is this one. We just have the, this is an alternating series. And then we have the odd powers of Z and so on. And this is valid for this one. Okay, however, if we now have sine Z over Z, we just divide everything by Z. So we're now left with 1 minus z squared over 3 factorial minus z6 over 7 factorial and so on. And this will now be true since we divided it by, we have, we divided the function by z, we now need the condition that the modulus of z is greater than 0. So what have we seen here? we expanded the function in its Lara series. And therefore, why is it removable? Our definition says that we only have non-negative powers of z minus z sub 0, which in this case is z equals 0. So there, we just have non-negative powers of z. And therefore, you have that that z is a removable singularity. Now, of course, as I have mentioned earlier, why do we call it removable? It means that we can redefine the function so that it will be analytic at that point. So in, in this case, how will we uh, redefine the function? Since we want it to be analytic, we just want it to be, it means that we want it to be differentiable. And of course, if it is differentiable at z equals 0, it has to be continuous there, right? And therefore, what do we need? We want our f of 0 to be equal to the limit of f of z as z approaches 0. Okay, then let us now compute the limit of sine z over z as z approaches zero, right? Um, by L'Hopital's rule, this is limit of cosine z over one. We also have our um, L'Hopital's rule in um, complex analysis and therefore this is equal to one. And so we now redefine f of zero to be equal to one. So previously, f of 0 does not exist, but this time around, we will just redefine um, f to be equal to 1 at that point so that it will be analytic at that point. So next, let us discuss the, um, the isolated singularities here. Let us classify whether it is a removable singularity or whether it is a whole or an essential Pole. So in this case, we know that um, the function is not defined at z equals 0, right? And in order to determine what kind of um, singularity this is, we just have to always express it in Lara, in its Lara series representation. So in this case, we will write the series representation of sine z first. So from our previous slide over here, we have sine z equals this representation. So it's just this time, instead of dividing everything by z, we divide everything by z squared. I showed that this one is represented by this. 1 minus 1 fourth, z minus 1, and so on. What will be the negative, the principal part? This is the principal part. We now say that z equals 1 is a pole of order 2. Next, we have f of z equals e raised to 3 over z. In our previous lecture also, we found the Leroy series representation of this, and it was equal to 1 plus 3 over z. 
plus 3 factorial, 2 factorial, z squared, plus 3 cube over 3 factorial, z cube, and so on. And this one will continue. Therefore, what does it mean? It means that z equals 0 is an essential pole because the negative powers of z will just continue up to negative infinity. We are going to classify also the zeros of an analytic function. So suppose we have an analytic function and we say that it has a zero of order n if first f of zero equals zero, of course, because f has a zero. Uh, I mean, this is true because z sub zero is a zero. So it means that the value of the function at that point must be equal to zero. And then what is this saying? The the value of the derivatives of f evaluated at that point are all equal to zero, but the nth derivative is not equal to zero. As an example, suppose we have f of z, z minus five cube. So we have f of five, that's equal to zero. Our f prime of z is three times z minus five. F double prime of, I mean, this is squared. This is six, z minus five. And then the third derivative is now equal to six which is not equal to zero. So what do we have here? F of five is equal to zero. And the first, I mean, this, is, this one should be five of five. And the second derivative evaluated at five is also equal to zero. And therefore, five is a zero of order three. It's a zero of f of order three. So just like in algebra, instead of saying order, we also say that it is a zero of multiplicity n. And take note that this is really the definition in algebra, right? Um, we are just looking at the, the exponent of the factor z minus 5. If the 0 is of order 1, we say that it is a simple 0. So it's like uh, the poles and the zeros, they have counterparts for each other. And the definition says that in order for us to be able to determine the order of a 0, we have to compute these derivatives. Right? However, the next theorem tells us that we don't have to do this in order to determine the order of a zero of a function. So let us look at this theorem. This theorem is saying that a function zero of order n if and only if we can write the function as a product of z minus z sub 0 raised to n times another function, but you have to be careful this function here has to be analytic at z sub 0 and the function phi is not equal to 0 when you evaluate it at z sub 0. So theorem is an if and only if, but the easy part is just this direction. That is when f has a zero of order n, we will show that we can write it in that particular way. So let me just write our hypothesis. Our hypothesis is f is analytic at z sub zero. For one direction, we are supposing there that f has a zero of n at z equals z sub zero. Now, since f is analytic at z sub zero, so since f is analytic at z sub zero, then we can represent it in its Taylor series. Take note, this is the Taylor series is because f is analytic. Remember that. The Laura series, we use that 
when the function is not analytic at the center of the representation, which in this case is z sub 0. Okay? But remember, we will just make use of the Taylor series because of the, of the fact that f is analytic at z sub 0. And here, let us recall that the coefficients are, gi are given by this formula. It's the kth derivative of f evaluated at z sub 0 over k factorial. Now, since f has a 0 of order n at z sub 0, by definition, it means that the kth derivative evaluated at z sub 0 is equal to 0 for k from 0, 1 up to n minus 1 only, but the nth derivative evaluated at z sub 0 is not equal to 0. What does it mean? It means that when you plug this in here, in our a sub case, it means that our a sub k will be equal to 0 for k from 0 up to n minus 1, right? Just write it here. Hence, we have that a, z, a1 up to a k minus 1 is equal to 0, which means that our representation for f of z now starts at, sorry, this one is n minus 1. It starts at a sub n. So it's a sub n z minus z sub 0 to the n, and so on. Or I can now factor out my z minus z sub 0 to the n, and I'm left with 1 plus a sub n plus 1, z minus z sub 0, and so on. I will now take this to be my phi of z. Now notice that my phi of z sub 0 here, what is that? My phi of z sub 0, oops, this one should be a sub n. My phi of z sub 0 is equal to a sub n. And by this, my a sub n is the nth derivative of f which is this one, it is not equal to zero. So this is not equal to zero and phi is analytic at z equals z sub zero. Why is that? Because our phi of z is just a polynomial there, right? So therefore it is analytic at z equals z sub zero. And there you go. It satisfies this one. We were able to show that we can write f of z as a product of z minus z sub zero raised to n times v of z. Determine the order of zero as uh, of zero as a zero of the function f of z equals z times sine z squared. Now, of course, zero is a zero of f because f of zero equals zero. Now, you might be tempted to say that the order of z is equal to one because I have a z here and then I have a function here. So you might be tempted to say that, miss, I will take this to be my phi of z. However, you cannot take that phi of z to be equal to sine z squared because remember, let us look at the conditions for phi of z. You have to satisfy two conditions. It has to be analytic there at that point and the value of the function at z sub 0 is not equal to 0. However, in this case, notice that if you take that, your phi of z there, uh, your phi of zero, I mean, because you're evaluating at, at zero, your phi of zero is sine of zero, which is equal to zero. And therefore, you cannot take that to be your phi of z. All right? So 
why am I doing that? In our proof here, in order to get the factor z minus z sub 0 raised to n, in order to do this, what did I do? I wrote my function in this way, right? So therefore, what we need to do here is to represent also our function as a series, okay? As a Taylor series. So let me just write it there. So the key is to express f in its Taylor series in order to get the order of the zero. So how do we express this? So remember, so write f in its Taylor series expansion. Recall, I will just write star okay instead of z sine star is star minus star cube so these are the odd powers alternating and therefore my sine z squared my star is z squared so that's z squared minus z squared z squared raised to five z squared raised to 7, 7 factorial, and so on. So this is true for, and therefore, our z sine z squared equal to z cube or our first term is z cube. There you go. And this is now my p of z. And we now take this to be my p of z. Remember, you have to check that your p of z really satisfies what we want. And our phi is analytic at z equals 0 because it is just a polynomial there. And my phi of 0 is equal to 1, which is not equal to 0. So therefore, it satisfies the two conditions that we want for our phi. And therefore, what have we shown here? z equals 0 is a 0 of order 3. All right, so we have just finished a theorem regarding the um, zeros of order n. So again, it and this function tells us how to get the order of a particular 0. So we have a counterpart for that for poles. So instead of using the definition, again, what is the definition for a pole of order n? Since this is a pole, you have to write it in its Laura series representation. Now, this one is saying that if you want to skip that, we have this theorem. This is saying that we have a pole of order n if and only if we can write the function as a quotient of an analytic function and z minus z sub 0 raised to the n. Take note that z minus z sub 0 raised to the n appears in the denominator because f has a pole at z sub 0. And again, this is valid in this disk. And of course, this disk will now make sense because for f to have a pole, f will have a Laura series representation and that um, Laura series representation will only be valid at a disk, all right? So just like in our theorem for zeros of order n, we want our function to be analytic at z sub 0, and we also want it, we want the value of the 
function phi to be non-zero when we evaluated at z sub zero. Just like in our previous theorem, I will only be proving one direction. So our hypothesis there is that suppose f has a pole of order n, we want to write it as a quotient of an analytic function in z sub minus z sub zero raised to the nth power. This means that we can write f of z, the last non-negative power occurs at um, with coefficient a to the negative n, correct? And then this is, let's say, a sub negative 1, and then a sub 0, and then... All right, so just like what we did in our previous theorem, I will now factor out my z minus z sub 0 raised to the n. And what is this? This is now a to the negative n. Let me just get more terms. This is a to the negative n plus 1. This is z minus z sub 0 because remember before the term is, the term right after this is 1 over z minus z sub 0 n minus 1. So here I should have a 1 there and this one will continue. And therefore, we will now take this to be our phi of z. And again, we have to take note that phi is analytic at z sub 0 because it is just a polynomial there. And our phi of z sub 0 is equal to, oops, this one should be positive. It's equal to a to the negative n, which is not equal to 0 by definition. This is the definition of an isolated 0. Let us recall first that we have a definition of an isolated singularity, right? If we have an isolated singularity at z sub 0, there exists an open, there exists a neighborhood at z sub 0 for which everything in, for all the points in this neighborhood, f is analytic, right? analytic there, except, but at z sub zero there, f is not analytic. That is a definition of an isolated singularity, correct? Okay, but this time around for an isolated zero, so almost the same here, we have a neighborhood for which for everything here, f of z, is not equal to zero, but it will only be zero at this point. That is a definition of an isolated zero. And as a consequence of that, take note that if z sub zero is a zero of a non-trivial analytic function, oh, sorry, this one should be, if z sub zero is an isolated zero, Okay, then if we get the reciprocal, 1 over f of z will have an isolated singularity at the point z sub 0. Why is that? If this is z sub 0, by definition of an isolated, um, an isolated 0, again, this one, this is a neighborhood for which f of z sub 0 is equal to zero, but for the rest, f of z is not equal to zero. And therefore, if we now look at the function one over f of z, okay, this one in this neighborhood, this is not equal to zero. That is defined because f of z is not equal to zero for all the points inside this neighborhood. But, so from here, the function, 1 over f of z is not analytic here because analytic at 
z sub 0 because the denominator will be equal to 0 when you have z equals z sub 0. 1 over f of z is analytic everywhere, right? And therefore, that that is the reason why the function 1 over f has an isolated singularity. So what we're trying to do here is that if we have a function f and then it has a 0 at z sub 0, if you have a quotient of two functions and your f occurs here, then you have h of z there. If you have a 0 at z sub 0, an isolated 0, then this quotient will now have an isolated singularity at z sub 0. Again, my assumption here is h is analytic. h has to be analytic at z sub 0. So here is what I was trying to say in this theorem. Okay, So if we have two functions, g and h, they are both analytic. So look at that. g and h are both analytic. And then h has a 0 of order n, this one. So h of z sub 0 is equal to 0 here okay, of order n. Since that appears in the denominator, it means that the function, the quotient of the two functions will now have a pole of order n. So for the proof of this, so let me just write our assumption. Suppose h has a 0 of order n. Then by our theorem on zeros of order n, we can write h of z to be equal to z minus z sub 0. But instead of calling it phi of z, I will call it alpha of z. You will see later why I'm going to use alpha and not phi of z, because I will be using phi later on. So for some analytic function alpha with alpha not equal to 0 at z sub 0. And therefore, if I plug that in in our f of z, which is equal to g of z over h of z, so this is g of z over z, oops, sorry, I should have an n over there, z minus z sub 0 to the n times alpha of z. I will now write it as g of z over alpha of z here over z minus z sub 0 raised to n. Why am I doing this? I am making use of this theorem. I can write the function wherein I have the denominator z minus z sub 0 raised to the n, and then I have an analytic function here which satisfies this, then the function will now have a pole of order n, and that will be my phi of z. So we have to make sure first that it satisfies our, our condition. Phi of z is that analytic at z sub 0? Well, we know from our assumption g is analytic at z sub 0. So that takes care of the numerator. Just here, g is analytic at z sub 0. What about my alpha of z? Where? Here. It's here. Al for some analytic alpha, this is analytic at z sub 0. This is also analytic at z sub 0. So is that enough? If the numerator and the denominator are both analytic at z sub 0, does it mean that the quotient is already analytic? No, we still need the condition that the denominator is not equal to 0. But this is true from here, right? And therefore, phi is really analytic at 
z sub 0 next. We have to show that phi of z sub 0 is not equal to 0. This is g of z sub 0, alpha of z sub 0. We know here that alpha of z sub 0 is not equal to 0. g of z sub 0 is also not equal to 0. And therefore, so this is not equal to 0, this is not equal to 0. So this entire thing, my phi of z sub 0 is not equal to 0. So therefore, by the theorem on poles, f has a pole of order n at z sub 0. Let us apply what we have learned there. So take note here that if you look at our denominators, so this one, so the zeros of the denominator are 1, negative 5, and 2. And the exponents will actually be the orders of the zeros. F has the following zeros with order. So z equals 1. That is a pole. This one is of order 1. z equals negative 5. Pole of order 1 as well. And then z equals 2. Pole of order 4. Again, just to show you if for the for z equals 2, this is our p of z. So it's important we have p of 2 is not equal to 0. The meaning of p of 2 not equal to 0, it means that for our p of z, p of z has no um, factor z minus 2. Okay, now for our next example, we have g of z equals 1 over z sine z squared. However, earlier we have shown that z sine z squared has a zero of order 3. But since this one appears in the denominator of g of z, then g has a pole z equals 0 of order 3. That is the end of this lesson.